Hi everyone and welcome to Caroline's cool down podcast. I've mentioned before I think sometimes people think because it's a cool down it's something to do with after an exercise class but um, no I suppose it's a bit of a life cool down it's a bit of a mental cool down it's just my chance to sort of talk about me as a person my life to where it is now my experiences what brought me to where I am now and the um the way a lot of those things have impinged or helped make me the kind of instructor that I am now and some of it's hard to listen to I suppose a lot of tragedies a lot of sadnesses but interspersed with a lot of um you know wonderful happy moments and life experiences also um I had a completely different um chat that I was going to have with you today uh, it was in my head through the week I was happy with it I thought yeah I'll do that and then of course uh I'm not a great sleeper, as many of you may not. Some would call it insomnia, but that's the way it is, and I've had it all my life, really. And through the night, I was awake quite early, and this was in my head. And then I dozed back over to sleep again, woke up this morning, and um, it was in my head again. Um, My mum and I uh, lived in the same road, uh, and only one house in between us. And she had been there, uh, I think I came to um, Bangor probably when I was about three. Um, so she had been in that house all her life. It was her family home. It was her um, work. It was her social life. Um, she brought my granny to live with us until granny died at the age of 96 um, my brother was brought home to that house after he was born and it was some wonderful times and I have wonderful memories of when um, you know tourists came a lot to Northern Ireland and it, it was a busy bustling kind of seaside resort do you know what I mean you had the amusements there this is Delaney's uh, amusements down where the Marine Court Hotel is now and uh, yes, it was it was old and lots of it didn't work very well, but it had its own atmosphere and uh, people remember it with great love and affection and going to spend their pennies and whatever, whatever else. So at that time, I mean, I was very young, but I remember mummy used to have guests from Scotland, England, Ireland, you had a big a big turnaround of of people from there and maybe not so many people from Europe and further afield as has become the way now mommy had uh, people that returned to her year on year and year and she never made a lot of money um but she made enough to keep herself independent which has always been extremely important to my mum and um from she was very young and worked picking potatoes from she was six years of age you know at that time scrubbing people's other people's hotels um front steps and she worked in the northern counties and I think I've mentioned before I may have done in my podcast because I don't doctor my podcast they just come out as I say them so they're not perfect but it's it's just how I choose to sort of to sort of do them so I may have mentioned um it before but um my mum had a really really tough life as many many people have and did then also and she worked her fingers to the bone and I mean to the bone because as a young girl she tried to keep to keep the the house the guest house going and a lot of people have this romantic notion of a a guest house you know and yes it's a wonderful thing but it's extremely hard work you never know who's coming to your door you know maybe if you have the luxury of 
of knowing that it, it might be a bit different, but that's not how it works. You know, people come, they make a booking. Um, in those days, they sent you their deposit and they arrived and that was it. And I mean, <laughs> if, as I said once before, I think if my mother wrote a book, it would be a bestseller. There's no doubt about that. And the only the only reason I suppose it hasn't been done is down to me. Um, you know, pushing it on forward and but I have I mean, my mother's life is embedded in my mind as much as my own because I've been alongside her for so many years. Uh two two times that I left to um work in London. One I spoke about, I think, in my last podcast, um, to work in the Savoy Hotel in London. Um, the other one I haven't mentioned yet, but uh, it will come hopefully. So yes, and you, know, you then it was a seasonal thing. So June, July, August would be very, very busy, and then the rest of the year would be quite quiet because obviously you know people didn't have as much money then to go away on holidays, and there wasn't the same um, system for traveling, and. So you had to make hay while the sun shone. So June, July and August were your busy, busy months. And then that money had to do you all the way through the rest of the, the year and the winter. So, I mean, my mother picked potatoes. She used to come home and she'd be green from head to toe. Um, you know, vine tomatoes, sorry, tomatoes at that time. She worked in a place in, in Bangor and um, it was tough going. Um, there's lots more I could say, but I this is not about people coming back and having a big conversation or an argument with me about how I perceive things. You know, this is just me getting my life out of my head. Um, and if you enjoy listening to it, I'm happy that you do. But... Um, so that that was fine. That's the way my mum's life had been. And then, of course, I'd mentioned that um, when I was six, my brother Philip was born. Unfortunately, he was born with a terminal illness. So my mother then had the house to uh, look after. She cooked all her own food. Um, so, you know, she didn't have money to bring somebody in to do this or to do that. And, you know, she just managed it. She was everything. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so my brother was born. And then Granny was living us with us at the same time. And uh, she was a great help. Early riser. And her stories about her, I could tell, maybe in another podcast that we're Oh, just unbelievable. Her travels to America, working out in America as a young girl. And and um, I'm sure many stories that lots of grandmothers and that, you know, hopefully tell her, their uh, grandchildren through the years that they've been growing up. Um, but yeah, so mummy held down two or three jobs um, still continued to, you know, manage the house and look after that and look after me and take us to school and all the rest of it and of course the years continued 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 then the troubles came and then um the uh soldiers had this uh, I think arrangement with like don't quote me on this but an arrangement with the guest houses so that you know uh they would need breaks you know after their um serving for so long so then they used to come down maybe to the guest houses for you know a weekend off and they'd enjoy themselves they'd go out they'd get drunk or whatever their thing was and uh, that was a uh, an experience in itself I have to say and I remember my mum was invited on to one of the big ships up, as was many of the guest house and B&B &B owners um, to say a thank you you know, from the the Navy and the Army about keeping them and, you know, having somewhere to keep them safe. And then, unfortunately, I think, uh, if I remember rightly, um, all the guest houses were, uh, there was some letters sent through to say that uh, 
they were not from a safety point of view they were not to keep um any of the soldiers or whatever so that sort of stopped that but uh the main reason that i decided to to make my podcast this morning about what i'm talking about now is that um my mother had many many life experiences in that house and as i said it was her social life also um tragedies that came from people who came to stay in the house and things that they did that you know she won't ever forget um you know things that would have been written in the paper uh without people really fully understanding what had happened you know it was nothing to do with my mother but you know other people that came to visit who had mental health issues and and on and on and on and on you know so that's why I say when people have this notion that you know running a guest house or a bed and breakfast is uh you know a fanciful lovely thing yes it is in many many respects but it is a very very difficult way to make a living my mother had knives taken to her she had people come to the door late at night who were staying in the house but then wanted to bring people in with them off the street and she had very 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 many difficult times I remember standing behind her fearful for her life and um, you know people that kicked her front door in and just that's the other side of the coin and it goes on and on and on but she she had to make a living and that was her life it was her home um but she had wonderful times as well you know people from all over the world and the and the latter maybe 20 30 years um you know as flights became more available would travel from you know america italy france spain austria all over the world and it was wonderful for mummy you know uh, she loved that she's a, a very much a people person M many of you who come to classes will have spent uh, well as much of my teaching life um where mummy was part of the classes as well and still was up until covid really um so you know what she was like and many of you are extremely fond of her enjoyed her stories that she would tell and you know, so you know the kind of person that she is. She was kind. She hated to see anybody hungry if she thought that anybody would come to the door and, um, you know, not have food. And she still has that thing today. Um, so, um, yeah, a wonderful, wonderful person with a great heart and um, courage and strength like I know no other, uh, really. Because, I mean, you know, she was a woman doing all those things on her own. When other people had husbands and wives that were bringing in a wage that uh, allowed them to be able to run a business, you know, a bed and breakfast or a guest house or whatever the case may be. Mummy was always her own and mostly only person that she had to rely on, you know. And that's a very, very difficult place to be. You know, my taught me how to paper, how to paint. I think I may have mentioned it before. How to plaster, how to pull um, fireplaces out of walls, how to paper ceilings, you know. And again, she just picked those things up from maybe somebody coming in and doing a job um, for her. And then she taught me how to do that. And I've done those things in my own home. Um, and it saved money and must as a great master. And that's just the way it was. And many, many years ago, the Queen's Parade development was something that had been discussed. And I'm talking way, way back. Um, and everybody in King Street that runs off the main street in Bangor was more or less either bought out of their houses or scared out of their houses or they left them anyway and I know of uh, two people that uh, um, I think one elderly person in particular now you're talking about maybe 30 odd years ago that uh, didn't sort of survive the pressure of what had to what was being done you know 
there was going to be a development and they needed King Street and you had to leave your home. And, you know, I was uh, young, young, young then. And uh, I do remember that. And people still talk about that. People who know um, about that. Um, then... <laughs> I, it's not that I don't know what I'm going to say, but I just, you know, I'm sure there's people in Bangor know many things about what went on about all that. But anyway, moving on from that, there was always in the background. So all those houses were bought. There was a few people, you know, stayed longer. And um, the last person to to leave a house there in King Street in relation to the development um, left when we were, when we had to leave as well. So that was 2001 then. And, um, but other than that, every so often in the newspaper, you would see, you know, something about the development, same as you do now, you know, the plans have passed, it's going ahead. And then five years down the line, it, the plans are passed and it's going ahead. And, you know, anybody that's had any interest in it or happened just even to buy a newspaper will be aware of that. Uh, so that was fine. It never, ever involved uh, where my mama and I lived. And we only had one house in between us. The gentleman that owns that house uh, still lives there. And is determined not to leave. And I say fair play to him. But uh, I know there's many of you that will listen to this and think, oh, well, we want we want our Queensbury development. And yes, of course, Bangor needs Queensbury development. I mean, Bangor, as it sits at the minute, is a complete dump um, compared to what it might have been. You know, people wanted to modernize it, change it from its Victorian kind of thing. But if you think about it, most people that go away on holidays or you travel abroad or you travel to big, um, you know, cities, you always want to go and see the older things. You know, it's not always modern buildings that people travel specifically to see. Yes, modern architecture, there are people who love that kind of thing. But in the main, people like to go and see, you know, older buildings and what was there before and the historical side of things. Um, but somehow people wanted to sort of take all those things away. So now we're left with what we're left with, which, as you'll have read yourself, um, charity shops, coffee shops and not much else. Yes, the marina is beautiful and you can look at it. But if you want to go to the beach, you've got to travel all the way around to Bally Home. Or whereas years and years ago, we did have a beach there. I, recently, I saw quite a few people um, talk about uh, down the steps, which is what I always called it, or people that lived in that area called it down the steps towards the beach. Um, but it was no, it was no messier than some of the beaches around when the tides have been in and out or there's been storms or things like that. Uh, I swam in it all my life or played in it or whatever. And uh, thankfully, I was always fine. But um, through the years, mum and I could have a conversation over the wall. As I may have mentioned, uh, for 16 years, I taught in Arts Leisure Centre. And mummy would be st standing on the top step of her steps at home uh, waiting for me to come home in the car and we would have chatted she'd have asked me how the class went that evening and did have talk to me about what happened in the day or if she'd had a call for you know bed and breakfast and when I would go to bed at night I would know that she was only one door away from me and because of the the life that we had had where she had lost her children I had lost one of mine we just um we just have a very special relationship and our lives have mirrored each other um for many many years the things that happened to mummy and the things that happened to me um so i loved where i lived because of that you know i didn't live in mummy's pocket and mummy definitely didn't live in mine it wasn't that kind of relationship and still isn't today but if she needed me, I was there. And if I needed her, I knew she was there. So in 2001, um, 
there's a big gap in between that, I know, but in a, another podcast, I may mention it. But in 2001, my uh, son, Philip, um, had to go and have a bone marrow transplant. Turned out to be a stem cell transplant. but um, And that was simply because his uh, terminal illness had sort of moved on a bit. And the things that were, he was getting were meaning that... Um, the terminal side of it was coming closer. So that was the only um, real chance we had of sort of helping to save his life. So 2001, we were heading off to the Royal Free Hospital in London. And I'll speak about that issue in another podcast. It will be tough to listen to, but for those of you who are interested, I'm happy to speak about it. And mainly because... It, as I said, it's a mental emptying for me, I suppose, because a lot of my life I have not spoken about. I know it. It's in my head every minute of every day. But I have chosen never to visit those places because of the grief side of it and sort of fear. So those of you who have had any mental issues, great tragedies or sadnesses in your life will understand that you know, people talk about talking therapies and speak to somebody. And while, you know, wonderful and do do that, take every opportunity to do that if you can. I can talk about the things, but in my experience, I think that even talking about those things doesn't really necessarily help in some ways. It, it allows you to get it out of your system, but I don't know that it really gets it out of your head. And I've mentioned that in my last podcast. I think, you know, what's in your brain, it's it's almost sort of, it feels as if it's in your DNA. But now this is my opinion. So, you know, there's no need for anybody to get their heckles up and, and say, I'm not downing anything. I'm just saying I am a chatter. But um, not outwardly to other people, maybe, you know, but to my son, him and I talk about many things. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to get into the deeper essence. And therefore, I have never really revisited my full feelings about even my little son Michael's death. Because there's a lot of things that happened on that day that are difficult to deal with, even if I touch on it in my own head. But I've gone off on a tangent now. <laughs> so... um. Yeah, 2001 anyway, we headed off. So at that point in time, 13 weeks we were there and then um, I knew my son had a leak at his aortic valve. Um, it was known by the hospital that he had a leak, but uh, at that time the mental thought was let's get the stem cell transplant done and get him out of this section and then cardiology or whatever can deal with that so when Philip developed pains through um, the last part of that he was given uh, gaviscon this was chest pains he was given gaviscon anyway he uh, ended up having to be rushed from there to um, the Middlesex hospital in London for um, a double bypass coronary artery um, and uh, a replacement aortic uh, a replacement valve so that's by the by that's another whole podcast on its own but anyway after the say 13 well if you add on maybe three or four weeks after that say 16 weeks um, we came home and I remember as I came home in my head thinking to myself maybe now you know after all these years um we'd been given the chance of the stem cell transplant things looked as if it might be reasonably successful obviously there's a lot of time to pass before you would really know and um I remember thinking maybe now a little bit of like a normal kind of life you know where you didn't have that constant pressure in your head or worrying about death and and lo and behold I was off teaching one day and came in the front door and found this old scraggy piece of paper it was a photocopied piece of paper 
and it was all offline and it was in an envelope and it was coming from the planning department. So it was obviously copied off somebody else's piece of paper and it was telling me that the four houses, so that was my mother's, my own, the guy that's in between who's still there and the person that owned the property on the other side of me, which they didn't live in. It was let out in flats or apartments. Uh, was going to be taken into the planning. So the original plan was for them to develop King Street, uh, Queen's Parade, and take it around the back of the four houses that I'm talking about. And then somebody had this wonderful idea that instead of doing that, let's just clear the land, knock those four houses down, and uh, they'll be part of that. Well, I could have just died on the spot because I don't know if any of you out there, when you think about moving house and you want to go and look at property, that's stressful in its own right, okay? But you have mentally made that decision that you are thinking about moving house, where you would like to live, what kind of house you would like to live in, and all that goes with that. So you're talking about somebody telling you that you own your house, but we're going to take it off you. Now, um, and not only, it was more my mum I was worried about because this was her business. Now, back in that day, uh, 2001, that's 22 years ago, mummy was in her late 60s. But my mother has been a worker, as I mentioned, all her life. There was no way my mother ever thought of the word retirement. And as a matter of fact, not very long before we moved, I remember mummy saying to me, um, I'll die in the house. They'll carry me out in a box. So my mother has never been a woman that enjoys sitting on her bum for very long. Um, going to bed is... Uh, a thing that mummy doesn't like. You know, this is a woman that was on her, on the go all the time from early morning to late at night. Her biggest joy, uh, apart from her children, which were her biggest tragedy, as she mentions to me often, um, was her dancing. Uh, she loved following the show bands. And on many occasions, she often tells me that the doorman would have said to her, you know, you come in, you dance, you go. Nobody knows your name. Nobody knows where you go to. Nobody knows where you come from. And that's the kind of person she was. She was a private person. She loved to dance and still does love, love music. But that particular kind of music, she was a fantastic jiver and still would be today. Um, but I just felt so terrible for mummy plus the uprooting of you know my son's um, funeral was uh, from the house that they were now telling me that I would have to give to them it was just the shock of it and I thought here we are home from all that we've just been through over in England and uh, the up and down side of everything that happened over there and now somebody's come to tell us whoop de doo we're going to take your house off you. And I know that people in Bangor thought, fantastic, do you know what I mean? Wouldn't you love to be in that position? You just name your price. And let me tell you and whoever you know that thinks that or ever mentioned it or thought it, just pass the word out there that that is not what happened. Um, when it did eventually come to be, now that was from, that was in 2001. So from 2001 up to 2014, there was uh, headlines in the paper, uh, Bangor, um, uh, Queen's Parade development, yes, going ahead, yes, plans are in, yes, developers are ready, nothing. A year later, same thing again. Now, every time that you or somebody you know read about that development or heard about that development, that is the only way we heard about it also. Nobody ever picked up the phone from any department to speak to us about it, to tell us what was happening, um, to tell us when they thought it might go ahead. Absolutely nothing. So you can imagine what shock it was if you think about the home you live in and where you're secure and happy. 
you go to the shop, you look at uh, the headline on a newspaper and what you see is uh, Queen's Parade development ready to go. We have planning in, in place and all the rest of it. And most of the time it was a lot of rubbish. Yes, they may have put that out there, but in my opinion, it was really just to, you know what I mean, keep the masses happy. Yes, we haven't forgotten about that. It's still going to go ahead and everything is all right. And nobody really cared about the people that were involved in it, the people whose lives were going to be affected by that. And as I mentioned, it's hard enough to go and pick a house and find a house you want to live in, even though you know you want to move home. Think of what it's like to be put in that position and to have to go and look to buy a house that you don't really want in a place that you don't really want to live in. But again, only because of their valuation or the money they have given you. Now, regardless of what anybody says, I am now aware that the person who was called in to do the valuation on our house was either retired or was just retiring. I've spoken to somebody just recently, actually, who knows the person um, very well and um, is aware that that was the case. Uh, I could say something else about how it was done, but what's the point? So that went on for 14 years. And then 2014, probably it would have started around 2013, there was another revival and yes, it was going to go ahead and yes, they were going to buy up TK Maxx and once they had TK Maxx, they were ready to go. Uh, there was one chap up uh, King Street, as I said, who still lived there and there was the four houses that I'm speaking about. Um, so... The gentleman that was picked to come out and do um, the valuation came out. Very straight-laced man. And we spoke to some of the other, one lady, one chap who was involved in the whole government side of the process, the department. And um, they gave their valuation. So your option was, for those of you who might ever hopefully not find yourself in this position. The option was you sold your house to them at the price they reckoned um, it was worth and you moved on. Number two, you sold your house to them and then rented it back off them, which would allow you to live in it. And three, you just sat in it but you wouldn't ever know when they were going to come along and vest you out. Now, if you think about that as a listener, would you like to be in that position? Would you like that option given to you in a home where you have lived your life, maybe reared your children, maybe it's a family home or anything else? So you've you've bought a house, you have deeds to say that you own it, you've paid for it, you've worked to pay those bills and all the rest of it, and then somebody pops along and gives you those three options. And it's, it's the saddest day. I mean, I've had some sad days in my life, but believe me, it's the saddest day. I remember my mum saying to me, well, you go, Caroline, you go and I'll just stay here. And I said, but mummy, no. I mean, my mum and I lived one house between each other all our lives. Obviously, I was in with her until I got married and then uh, was in 13 the thought of that just, it, it was just, you know what I mean? My mum and I, as I said, had been through so much together that the thought of that, I was like sending her away to, you know, Siberia or something. I, I, and I said to her, no, no, mummy, that's no good. That's no good. Now, my mother just went around looking at houses in a complete haze. There was nowhere she wanted to go but where she lived. There was nothing she wanted to be in. You could have given her the castle. You know, a castle anywhere, something with 26 rooms. She wasn't interested. The house she lived in was her home. All her memories were there. Her mother was there with her. Her children were there with her. You know, all the social memories that she had of all the people that returned year after year and the sad things and the harsh things and you know, all the other things as well. So, I mean, 
I mean, I see what it has done to my mother. But just so much worse than it actually is. I mean, mummy would still walk down around that area and look at it. And I, I, I just can't, can't think about how sad it must be for her. But um, I remember a particular state agent in Bangor was brought in to sort of liaise between the, um, you know, the guy who was uh, in the department who gave the valuation. And he made his valuation anyway. And as far as I'm concerned, they really ripped mummy off. And when I knew that I was right was when I spoke to the estate agent. And I said to him, I don't think they've done right by mummy. And he says to me, well, she is 80 years of age. Now, that sentence is going to haunt me for the rest of my life because I wish I had been a bolshy person. I know I'm very good, ladies and gentlemen, especially those of you who come to me uh, for classes to say to you, no, go to the doctor with that. Go and speak to somebody about that. But when it comes to me, I've never been any good at that. And I think that harks back to just days and days of my young life at school as I mentioned in earlier podcasts about being bullied but I so would have loved to have said to him and it was it was on the tip of my tongue on the phone that day when he said it to say but what's that got to do with anything this lady worked her fingers to the bone I know that I'm living proof of what my mother lived what she endured what she suffered and believe you me those are appropriate words for what I'm I'm talking about um you know and he, he was just more or less admitting exactly what I had felt they valued mummy's house on the fact that she was the age she was and um that's all I reckoned now I mean as far as I was concerned I wasn't interested and never have been. Money's never been my driver. And as my class people will know, <laughs> if it had been, I wouldn't be charging what I charge for my classes. I know that. It's always been about the people for me. Yes, I have to pay my bills and I need money to pay my bills, but it's never been my driver. So I wasn't interested in money that, you know, God forbid, if anything happened to me, would come to me. I wanted right for mummy and she never got it. And anyway, she never, she just had no interest. She just went through that whole period. And that whole period lasted about a year and a half of toing and froing and, you know, moving forward then not moving forward and just horrible. I mean, it, it will all stay with me until I die. I am so sorry that I didn't leave my mum in her home. Because she lives in a house now, and it's a new house, but she doesn't want it. She hates the house. It's, you know, a modern house, and it's so different. Um, and I, I, I speak to my mother three or four times a day. I see her every day of the week. And I know that she harks back to wanting to live in that house she said to me so many times if I could buy that house back I would buy it if I would buy that house could I buy that house back I would buy it she would live in it you know and here we are in 2022 nearly eight years down the line Queensbury development is still wherever it is mummy's house or home is still sitting there and she could have been in that. The gentleman next door is still living in his. But again, fear. That was fear because mummy went along with me because she she wouldn't have been able to do all the things that she would have had to have done to look into getting a house and all this kind of thing. I mean, she was 80 years of age. How many 80-year-olds do you know choose to move house? And um, <clears throat> so it was all on me. Excuse me. It was all on me to try and sort these things out. And it was just one of the worst periods of my life as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I've had many. But um, 
so that's why my co- podcast this morning is about what it is because before I, I try and lie in bed as long as I can so that I'm not up at the the start of sunrise but it was just in my head I could just see her sitting I could you know she thinks about it every day she wants to be there and <clears throat> I recently found out as well that TK Maxx at that point had not been bought. TK Maxx was still owned by whoever owned TK Maxx. So there was untruths or lies, if the case be known, um, told to us at that time. Again, I would call it a bullying tactic, you know, just to to scare us out. And I'm ashamed to say it probably did. It probably did scare us out. And... If they would even knock it down, if they would even knock Mummy's house down, she'd be happier because her biggest fear is that somebody else will end up living in that. No matter how many times I say to her, look, Mummy, that won't happen. You know what I mean? It's going to be part of the development. But every day of my life, at some point, I am sad for my mother. Seven years that she could have been living in that house that she would have been still probably doing her bed and breakfast and well able to do it. And on the back of lies, on the back of bullying, on the back of everybody conniving to who would be called in to do evaluation and all the rest of it. And as I found out, um, about two weeks after I made a call and was told that the gentleman who came in to do the evaluation had now retired. (laughs) So... Yeah, until the day I die, I'll be very, very sad that I didn't let my mum live in the house and wasn't more of a bully and stood up against them like the gentleman next door. You know, we tried everything, like for like, Victorian house. We didn't, we didn't even, we didn't even say that we wanted any money. Just you know, give her the same kind of house so that she was living in the same kind of environment as she is now. And it's funny, the gentleman next door, I met him a couple of days ago and he gave me a real up-to-date input in what was going on. And believe you me, like just, you know, people are always shocked when they hear things. Uh, if you listen to Stephen Nolan and something comes up, you know, um, about, you know, whistleblowers and listeners are always so shocked that that could happen and somebody would do that. And, you know, but believe you me, those things go on all the time. The only thing is that somebody blows the whistle and we get to hear about it. So, yeah, I may sound a bit, well, I'm a bit of everything at the minute because my mum's an extremely important part of my life and always has been and to think that for seven years of her life she's had to live in a house that she hates um you know when she could have been still living in the house that she had all her memories from her social life and everything else and that makes me really really sad so I think maybe I've said enough for now as I've said before ladies and gentlemen or whoever's listening and even if it's only one person um, this started out really I suppose just for me to talk about things in life and as I said about my experiences what's brought me to the person that stands in front of you if you are people that come to class and listen to me teaching and all the rest of it and I've been asked a couple of times to write a book and Uh, Dot Kirby used to be the health correspondent from BBC when I was over in London with my son. Her and I spoke every single day and she said to me, Caroline, keep notes every day that you are in that hospital. Write notes, write notes, write notes. And she used to ring me and talk about what had happened and how the day had gone and wonderful person. And she had said to me, write a book write a book I've had two or three journalists the same and I have I think I mentioned it in one of the earlier podcasts I have sort of written over the years you know lots of just lots of memories lots of things I'm talking to you about now but it's when you actually come to write it down in a formal sense it's which part of that life do you start at because 
there's so many different parts of it you know it's not kind of like I said when I was going to start doing the podcast I thought well you know should I start it from when I was young uh, and then take it all the way through to today but then I've recently as I've started to do them what happens is there's different things that have nothing to do with you know the things I thought I would talk about and um and that's what happened this morning. I had something else planned in my head. There's nothing on writing. I don't clean it up. I don't do anything with it. I just say it as it is. And I try and keep it as as right as possible. So I don't get up anybody's nose. But um, yeah. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, or listener, um, I hope that my experiences is in some way, good, bad or indifferent, will maybe enlighten you a little bit. Maybe you can re- relate to them if you've been through them yourself. Or maybe just help you to keep carrying on in the face of adversity. And God knows most people don't have to seek very far to find their own adversity. And everything is, you know, what one what one's person grief what one person's grief is you know to somebody else maybe something that they can manage very well so there's no there's no prizes for what's the hardest or the difficult or the saddest you know what I mean but um this has helped me in a in a bit I suppose because I am able to delve into places that maybe I mean people in class wouldn't really know my inner feelings about things I've spoken about today or things I have already spoken about or what I might speak about tomorrow you know so it empties my head a little bit so while I hope that I might help you then just know that you help me even if you only listen for two minutes so if you want to get in contact with me as I've said before um anything you want to ask me um, at Caroline's Pilates. You'll get me on Facebook there. You can WhatsApp me. You can uh, send me a message. And I do, I'm I'm very naughty. Um, I must put my website up live. I'll try and do that today. Um, So have a good day. Uh, I see it's a little bit darker than it was the last few days, which were beautiful. Lifts your heart when you wake up and see that blue sky. No matter how low your heart may feel, um, listen to a nice piece of music, something that makes you feel happy. And when you're sad, try not to listen to sad music because that's not a good thing for most. Maybe for some it works, but so I'll say have a good day. Enjoy it to the best of your ability. One foot in front of the other and keep your heart up. Lots of love. Speak to you soon. Take care. Bye bye.